This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles. First 30 days, completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the promo code BRAINFOOD. Deep in the heart of Indonesia's Sumatra rainforest, where tigers hunt, rhinos stampede, orangutans play, and cuckoos sing, blooms a flower that does its very best to attract more attention than any of the animals. The rare Amorphophallus titanum, or Titan arum, or known by its more descriptive nickname, the corpse flower, is described as the world's largest flower. But that isn't this plant's claim to fame. No, this rare, beautiful fauna is really known for its stink. It's been said that the smell that emits from the corpse flower resembles, well, rotten flesh. From the personal experience of the co-author of this piece, who was privileged enough to take a whiff during an exceptionally rare blooming on August 23, 2014 at the Huntington Botanical Gardens in San Marino, California, we can attest that it smells awful, though said individual describes it more like a strongly smelling porta potty or alternatively garbage that's been left out in the sun. That said, as none of us here have smelled a rotting corpse, we're not really sure if that's equivalent or whether it's something with a distinct odor. Either way, it's not pleasant. You might at this point be wondering how this flower came to smell this way from an evolutionary perspective. Well, the purpose of this smell is to attract pollinators, more specifically sweat bees, flies, and dung beetles. These insects are drawn to the smell because they think it is rotting flesh and a perfect place to lay their eggs. When the insects come in for the landing, they become covered in the plant's pollen. After laying their eggs, they fly off to spread the pollen across the forest. Despite the writing from the first ever European to discover the plant, Italian botanist and explorer Adorado Beccari in 1878, the corpse flower is not a man-eater, nor is it even carnivorous. It is simply trying to imitate a pollinator's favorite place. Botanists are still trying to figure out what exactly inside of the plant produces the smell. A sulfur-infused chemical is almost definitely present, giving it the tinge of rotten egg. Additionally, it is speculated that putrescine and cadaverine, compounds found in decay and flesh are also involved. They are also found in other plants in the aeroid family, a group of plants known for their stench like the skunk cabbage, making it likely it has a presence in the titan arum as well. It is also believed that the plant produces heat, allowing the aroma to spread further out into the forest. Despite the colloquial name, the corpse flower plant as a whole is actually not a single flower, but an inflorescence. An inflorescence is a cluster of flowers, in this case hundreds of male and female flowers, which botanists believe are the actual part of the plant that produces as the stink buried at the base of the stem. There are two visible parts of the titan arum, the spathe and the spadix. The spathe is a petal-like outer covering, like the green layer that covers an ear of corn. On the inside of the spathe, which is only visible when the plant is in bloom, is a dark velvety purple maroon color that reportedly at times is akin to rotten flesh. The spadix is the fleshy upright column in the center of the plant that resembles a cactus without needles. When the plant is getting ready to bloom, the spadix can reach heights upwards of 7 to 8 feet tall. What makes it even more unique is that it can take years for the corpse flower to reach the blooming stage. When it's not blooming, it still produces a leaf, which is actually many leaflets attached to a single green stalk, resembling a green palm tree. Even this can grow to decent-sized heights, topping out at 12 feet tall. Botanists still haven't established any sort of timetable to mark when the corpse flower will bloom. Enough energy needs to be stored by the corm, the bulb-like tubular bit buried in the soil that the plant arises from before a blooming occurs. This can take a year or 40 years, typically 7 to 10 years in cultivation, but when it does, a well-trained eye can spot what is happening early on in the growing process. The plant grows at a rapid rate, up to 6 inches a day, so fast you can literally see the change with the naked eye if you watch extremely patiently. When the plant finally blooms, after potentially many years of waiting, the entire blooming cycle takes 24 to 30 hours, about 12 hours to completely unfurl its enormous spathe, and then bloom for a few hours, which is also when its stench is at its strongest, then 12 hours to wilt away, perhaps taking another decade or more before it will bloom again. When Odorado Bakari and his men came across the plant in 1878, they were the ones who gave it its scientific-sounding name of Amamorphalus titanum. 
But if you know Latin, you know that that name isn't very dignified at all, as it rather loosely translates to misshapen gigantic penis, a reference to the large spadix. This is similar to that time a physician, Richard Brooks, in 1763, examining a giant bone of a then unknown creature, decided to call it scrotum humanum because it looked like a giant set of human balls. To be clear, Brooks knew it wasn't a fossil of a giant scrotum, but nevertheless decided to name it thus because apparently men of all eras of human history can't help but make genital jokes at every opportunity. If you're wondering, this turned out to be a bone from a megalosaurus, which was only allowed to be rechristened after a fair amount of debate among the International Commission for Zoological Nomenclature, who desperately wanted to call it something other than Scrotum Humanum. So going back to the flower of the hour, before Odorade Bakari's giant penis naming, the Indonesian natives named it Bunga Bangkai, meaning dead man's flower. The flower was so large that Bakari and co. concluded that the only thing that could have pollinated it was an elephant. To study the plant further, Bakari had his men dig up the 130-pound specimen and drag it back to Italy. As Bakari wrote in his journal, two men could scarcely carry it. Bakari also brought seeds with him and dispersed them among institutions. The first bloom in European captivity was at England's Royal Botanical Garden in Kew, located near London in 1889. The corpse flower was such a sensation and attracted such a crowd that the police were called in for crowd control. Another of the plants grown outside of its natural habitat didn't bloom again until the mid-1920s. This first blooming of the corpse flower in the United States was at the New York Botanical Gardens in 1937, using seeds from the University of Bonn's flower in Germany. It was such a hit with the public that the plant was designated the official flower of the Bronx, which it remained until 2000, when that distinction was taken away by the daylily. Today, the corpse flower is much more common across the globe, known to attract pollinators and human visitors alike with its garbage dump-like aroma. There are believed to be over 80 corpse flowers in the United States right now, being meticulously tended to in botanical gardens and conservatories. So if you are a botany admirer or just a fan of that garbage water left in the sun smell, there very well could be a corpse flower near you that is ready for a short and stinky close-up. But you know what doesn't stink? That would be today's fantastic sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. You can get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, if you sign up, you get 30 days completely free. Just go to curiositystream.com forward slash brainfood and use the promo code brainfood. Now, if you enjoyed today's video, let's just say that there's not exactly any lack of weird nature content on Curiosity Stream. There's the series series Invisible Nature, which looks at the more fascinating aspects of plant life, like plants that have lived for 5,000 years. I'd also recommend checking out Nature Tech, which basically looks at all the crazy things that nature has developed, like biomimetics. It's all really great stuff. In fact, all of the stuff on that platform is really good. It's also available on a whole bunch of platforms from, you know, if you've got a Roku, Android, Xbox One, it's pretty much available on everything, and it's available worldwide. Just go to curiositystream.com forward slash brain food, link below to get started, 30 days for free. And now for a bonus fact. Musk has been prized since ancient times for its alluring fragrance. Today it is generally synthetically produced, but where exactly does that musk smell originally derive from? Well, it turns out, before modern synthetic production, when it first came on the scene, musk was only found in a scrotum-like sac on the bellies of male musk deer. Musk deer are found throughout Asia, including in Afghanistan, China, India, Mongolia, Nepal, Pakistan, and Siberia. Small, the largest, barely reach two feet in height and weigh no more than 40 pounds. The male of the species has a scent gland, sometimes called the musk pod, that sits between its belly button and its genitalia. Resembling jiggly bits, early on, the Sanskrit speakers who started harvesting the gland used their word for testicle, muskasu, to refer to both the gland and its product. The first use for musk was in Ayurvedic medicines, the preparation of which required the glands first to be dried and then ground. At this point, it is said to have a sharp, repulsive animal smell with ammonia accents that resemble urine and castoreum. Eventually, however, it was learned that by heavily diluting the stinky powder in alcohol, the bestial smell disappeared, which likely made the medicine seem much more palatable. In addition to removing the animal stink, the dilution also revealed an underlying pleasant and complex aroma. Making its way through ancient civilizations, deer musk became highly prized and very expensive. By the dawn of the 19th century, pound for pound, it cost more than twice that of gold. Later, as cheaper synthetic substances became available, they were likewise called musk. 
Today, musk is still harvested from musk deer, and while the Convention on the International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Flora and Fauna regulates their harvest, poaching does remain a problem. The highest quality musk comes from Vietnam and is called Tonkin musk, while most of the lowest quality stuff comes from Russia. Siberian deer musk sells for roughly $150 per cubic centimeter, nearly five times the equivalent price of gold at the equivalent weight. Other animal sources of that musky smell include civet cats, sperm whales, and beavers. For for instance, secretions from beavers' castor sacs located near their anal glands have a musky and vanillary scent. The substance, called castoreum, is used in various expensive perfumes, in some cases used to create the new car smell, and used in some foods as natural flavoring as a substitute for vanilla. Another common musky additive to high-end perfumes is ambergris. This begins as a large compacted mass of the indigestible parts of a squid and other gross stuff in the intestines of a sperm whale. Floating on the ocean until it washes up on the shore, the best ambergris spends years oxidizing from a combination of salt, air, and sun. Prized for its unique scent, ambergris is in high demand by perfume manufacturers and the amorous alike. In fact, high-quality ambergris can sell for $20 per gram, which is about $9,000 per pound. As you might imagine, there is a thriving industry in ambergris hunting, and the competition can be fierce. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below, and don't forget to subscribe. When you're subscribing, hit the notification bell. Also, definitely check out our sponsor for today's episode, CuriosityStream. There's a link to them below. And as always, thank you for watching.